So seven months ago, we interviewed, right? We talked, we stood probably right here somewhere. Yeah. And you told me that the best month at that time that you had had was like 200 grand, right? Yeah. Uh, have you had a better month? In the- so we have. Uh, naturally, we've got some more cars, yeah. so we better. Uh, our biggest month to date has been just shy of 300,000. Now, what's cool about that is we haven't, since you left, we've been all slow season because mm. it's hot. It's summertime. Nobody wants to rent cars over here. February and March are our two biggest months. Wow. So I'm anticipating we could get up to half a million dollars a month with this fleet. 500. Yeah. Wow. That would be so cool. We'll have to do a follow-up yeah, video we'll this follow to see up. what happens, but I'm crossing my fingers sure. to reach the half a million mark in one month. Huge yeah. congratulations to that. I can't wait till you're at a million a month. Yeah. So Brandon, you have over 200 cars on Turo. And a lot of people are wondering why stay on the platform Turo? Why not create your own? That's a great question. Uh, so I originally got into Turo a little over three years ago now because I really believe that Turo is going to do to the rental car companies what Uber did to taxis. And when people join Turo, really what they're doing is they're taking advantage of two things. We're starting our own business on the Turo platform essentially, but Turo is doing the marketing for us and they're also doing the insurance. Mm. So these are the two primary pieces that really keep people on Turo. I know obviously people are gonna to wanna to get off of Turo and do private rentals and make more money, but then you're gonna to have to go acquire your own customer mm-hmm. and you're gonna to have to figure out a way to insure that car while it's out. So it, it's very easy to say, oh my gosh, you're getting so much revenue off of Turo, why don't you move it? And you know, ideally we'd like to and maybe we are in small part to start, but those are the two issues that you're mm-hmm. gonna run mm-hmm. into is, okay, well now that Turo's not bringing you these customers, how are you gonna find them? Sure. And maybe if you have a great way to, to figure that piece out, then I, I encourage you to get into private rentals and you can still do both simultaneously, uh, but you also got to insure it. So Turo has a really good deal worked out to where all these cars are insured while they're out. The claims process is fair and it's simple. You're going to have to figure out if you rent privately, if something were to happen, like how is your car going to be yeah. covered? And you don't, you definitely don't want to just rent it out there and not have it covered and then deal with it on the back end because that's where you can make a very, very costly mistake with this. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And another question for you. How much money on average do you think you pay Taro on a monthly basis? Do you have any idea? Uh, so that's a, that's a really good question <laughs> because a lot of that, there's some mystery to it. There's different plans you can do with yeah. Turo. There's four different plans. And depending on how much you want to take in, it just increases your deductible. So we're on the 90 plan. So if somebody were to rent our car for $100 a day, Turo is going to give us $90. Mm-hmm. But they're also charging the customer fees on the other mm-hmm. side that we don't see. They call them trip fees and then also some insurance fees. Mm-hmm. If they're under age, they're gonna charge them some fees and we have no access to see any of that. Yeah. So how much they're actually making off sure. of us is probably a heck of a lot of money. Uh, but on paper, they're just taking 10% of what we list a cool. car for per day. We've talked a lot, right? I'm, I'm the second largest wholesaler in the nation when so it comes cool. to real estate, yeah. right? Yeah. You're the second largest tarot operator in the yeah. nation. Um, and there are gonna be people watching right now that are commenting and they're keyboard warriors and they're like, you're not the second largest, right? So yeah. for you, um, how do you measure that, right? Do you measure it based off of the amount of cars that you have or do you measure it based off the amount of revenue you generate? So Turo really holds these stats close to the chest. They don't promote it on their website, which I wish they would because I think it's great competition <laughs> that we all wanna fight with each other yeah. on being the best. And uh, I've had a lot of backlash on that too because even in the last mastermind event, live mastermind event here, we had three hosts that had over 200 cars. So there's a couple of different ways that you can look at Mm -hmm. the top hosts, right? Are we talking about number of cars or are we talking about dollar amount that we bring in? Mm. And so the reason why we're in that spot, we may not have as many cars as some of these hosts have, but we've got a lot of high end Mm. cars like this Rolls Royce Dawn behind you. We'll have months that do 25,000 and mm. some people have 30 cars on their fleet and don't make that much. Yeah. Uh, you make of it off of one, one car. car. Yeah. So I'm talking about net m- money that's actually brought in from mm. Turo off of bookings. So thankfully we've got a lot of higher end cars mm-hmm. and we just get that up really, really high. But don't mistake cash flow for profit. So this yeah. is a big lesson that you guys need to understand when you start your Turo business. Sure. And that's why I'm huge on looking at the numbers. recently did kind of like a merger. Talk to me a little bit about that. There's really two big stages with Turo. The first one is just managing a fleet by yourself. And you could do anywhere from five to, I know people doing 30, 
probably that's the max, like 30 cars, and that's just gonna depend on type of cars that you've got and location. And then you're gonna get to a point to where you're like, okay, do I wanna just live in the weeds here and go through this, or do I wanna kinda turn this into an actual business? And there's so few people that have turned this into an actual business, mostly because there's just really not any education out there on how to do it. It's kinda mm -hmm. like, you know, Turo doesn't say, here's a playbook, it's not a franchise. Yeah. We're kinda left to our own devices to figure out ways to overcome problems, and then of course, you know how it is because you have built and scaled many companies. As you scale things, systems break, yeah. you know, people leave, people like aren't good fits for your culture, and then you have to fill in the gaps and like change things. So right now, we're going through that stage of like pushing the bubble mm -hmm. and letting it burst a little bit, fixing processes and procedures and then building it back up. But really our ultimate goal is to build a large scale fleet that can be in direct competition with Hertz, Budget, all these guys to uh, be a big sustainable business on Turo. Sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so in doing the merger basically then and acquiring a bunch of the co-host type stuff, like what additional staffing did you have to get? Like obviously we're in a huge operation right now, you know, 200 cars, you know. Uh, talk to me about staff, like what does that look like? Yeah, so the biggest thing that you guys need to understand when you're, when you're growing this that I've learned across the way is you have to have metrics that tell you when it's time to do something. Right? Instead of just letting things fall apart and letting it go haywire yeah. and causing chaos, instead you look at like, actual, I'm a numbers guy, so mm -hmm. I look at actual metrics and I go, okay, this is gonna tell me when to do this. And I think the thing that I like to compare it to the most is like being in a jumbo jet, mm -hmm. right? Imagine flying a jet and none of the buttons are labeled. Sure. Right? You have no idea how to do anything. So what I've been trying to do is as I grow this, I wanna have a metric for everything, right? Like how long does this tire last on this car versus another car, right? With sports cars, Tires are gonna yeah. last less, less as a, a economy car, right? And then with an economy car, they're gonna be cheaper. Mm -hmm. My ultimate goal is being able to create a spreadsheet mm -hmm. to where I can answer the biggest question people ask on Turo. Sure. What car works? Yep. What car works on Turo? This is what everybody wants to know. And unfortunately, there's I can't give you an, uh -huh. an answer because of all these different variables. So what I've been working on is creating like the ultimate guide and the ultimate spreadsheet to be able to put in all of the data mm -hmm. and then go, Boom, that's the right car for yeah. me. Or it's not, stay away from it, don't touch it, and that's really just gonna depend on your plan, your location, mm -hmm. your finances, all these different things. So yep. that's what I've really been working on right now. That's what's been helping me scale yeah. for my particular goal, but I've also been trying to expand it to giving other people the ability to do it. I hope you're enjoying the business tour so far. Really quick, if you wouldn't mind, if you know of a business that you think would be a really cool tour, or if you own a business that you would like to get featured, all you have to do is text 480-418-5339, the word business, okay? Again, 480-418-5339, the word business, and we'll see if you qualify or if the business qualifies for us to go ahead and tour it. Now let's just go ahead and get back to the tour. We're standing here in front of the Huracan. We yeah. also got the 488 here. Yeah, the fun stuff. The fun stuff. <laughs> and you have a green uh, Huracan as well. We do, a convertible. A convertible, yeah. it's in the shop right now. It is, yeah. Uh, so of 200 cars that you own, right, what is the highest uh, revenue earning car that you have? So it's changed from year to year. Last year, it was actually our green Huracan. And this year, it's this 488. And is that just because the green one's been down? The, well, it's a combination <laughs> of things. It's the green one's been down, and this one, there's not really any competition in the market. So if somebody wants the creme de la creme Ferrari, this is it. What does the 488 bring in on average? The cost to acquire a car like this is gonna be 250 to 300,000, and we'll charge around 500 to $900. That's the per spread day. per day. Okay. Uh, they get 100 miles with that. Mm -hmm. Anything that they go over, they're charged per mile. How and much per mile in a car like that? So the way that that's calculated is if this is $1,000 a day mm -hmm. and they get 100 miles, that's $10 a mile. Okay. Right. Yep. So they just divide the two and that's why everyone is different. The sure. higher dollar the car, the more expensive it's going to be because of that formula. For how long have you owned the 488, for example? We haven't even had, I'd say we're getting close to about a year mark with okay. that car. And if you just ballpark, over the last year, on average, all the seasons combined, weekdays and weekends, everything combined, yeah. what is the average monthly income on a car like that? Uh, you're gonna be five on the low end and 25 on the high end. Okay. It's, I know that's a big spread, but there's so many different, again, there's so many different mm -hmm. factors that play into it. 
We were just talking about our green Huracan. That was our biggest money maker last year. It's been sitting idle yeah. for three months because of one little thing that it took us so long to diagnose and mm -hmm. fix. We're talking about a hundred dollar part, for sure. but it took three months to find that part. So there's a potential of $75,000 in lost mm -hmm. revenue. You know, you obviously have two full-time mechanics. Yeah. Uh, you have four porters now. Yep. And then you've got uh, somebody that sits up at the front there. Yep. Uh, is that pretty much the most of your employees at the moment? Yeah. And then all, you know, I work on buying and selling cars and then through a merger that we just recently did, we've got two other people that are working on building up our courses and things like that. And a yeah. videographer that follows me around that we sure. make videos to kind of promote what we're doing. So that's the whole team. Yeah. And as you grow, like the team, just, you got to bring people on. Sure. And when you feel that pain point, you go, it's time. I got to hire somebody else. So what are the porters actually doing? Like what's their day to day look like? Yeah. So they get here early in the morning, they get ready for the day. So we do handwritten cards to all of our customers that we put inside of the vehicle. So they're prepping for the day. They're looking at what do we got to deliver? What's coming here? How do we set that up? So we try to stay on top of things instead of reacting as they come. And so they'll wash cars, they'll check in cars, they'll check out cars. Uh, Sandra up front does all the communications with customers. So they'll communicate with Sandra. So it's really just facilitating all the transactions mm -hmm. that we have on a daily basis. Cause there is cars coming in and out of here constantly. Yeah. Like constantly, sure. like right now they're all on the outside trying yeah. to do it so that we can film this. But otherwise it is a crazy zoo in here and right. people are running around like crazy. <laughs> and they're driving cars around too, right? Like they're taking yeah. cars to the airport. They're picking them up from the airport. Yeah. They're dropping them off. I mean, they're yeah. all over the place. Yeah. yeah. So one main question that I would ask yourself right away, if you're going to start a Turo business is, am I close to a place where people come in? Mm. And this, look at where all the rental car yeah. companies are, right? They are in by the airport, by the airport <laughs> right? So if yeah. you're not close to a major airport, you might want to reconsider doing a Turo business because of the traffic that you might not get connected to. Yeah. So with us, we're about a 12 minute drive from the airport. We should be closer. I wish we were closer. Our next facility will probably be right next to the airport. And that's where most of your bookings are going to come from. All right, Brandon, we're standing in front of two G-Wagons right now. We got another G-Wagon over yeah. here. And I'm noticing uh, by all the headlights, we don't have any of the newer G-Wagons. So right. talk to me about that. So G-Wagons are awesome. People love G-Wagons. So, I mean, they're fun to drive. They look pretty unique and cool. They've got a lot of fancy gadgets in it. It's a Benz. People yeah. love Mercedes. And so people love G-Wagons. The problem with listing G-Wagons on Turo is, I mean, just by default, SUVs depreciate mm. very quickly, all the way to zero in the graveyard. <laughs> and when it comes to a G-Wagon, particularly because of their popularity right now, most specifically because of tax incentives that they get mm -hmm. for just depreciating the whole asset right away, it's driven up the prices mm. on all the new G-Wagons. So there's some people that are paying 30, 40, $50,000 over MSRP to get an already expensive, 200 plus thousand dollar G-Wagon. And when you're listing a car on Turo, that like skeleton in the closet mm -hmm. is depreciation. Mm. And this is where, this is probably the biggest quicksand for anybody that's gonna get into Turo is not paying attention to depreciation. Mm. And you have got, mar I mean, the market can do crazy mm -hmm. things. Uh, just cars naturally fall into certain trends. The nice thing about these old G-Wagons is once they've kind of taken a few year dip, mm -hmm. they do this curve where they just kind of stabilize mm -hmm. and they just go down a little bit. This car with 200,000 miles of people will stay, still pay good money wow. for them yeah. because they're just cool cars that people are, all, they're timeless. Yep. Like the design is timeless. They're super unique. Nobody else is building anything mm -hmm. like this. And so of all the SUVs that exist right now, these are gonna hold their value the best. Really? And that's why we've got six of these with G-Wagons you get a lot of broken windshields mm. because it's the window, flat. instead of it being like this, is like that. So when yeah. a rock hits it, it doesn't ricochet off. It just goes bam and plants right into the window. Uh -huh. And so you're gonna get a lot of windshield mm. claims off of this. What are you using to build out each individual PL? Like quite literally, are you using QuickBooks? Like how are you doing it? Yeah, so that's an amazing question. And this is something that don't even start in this business mm -hmm. unless you're gonna watch your numbers because it will definitely lead to chaos. I use a couple of main platforms. The first one that I use is QuickBooks. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have fancy accounting firms and accountants. I have none. I have a $40 QuickBooks subscription <laughs> and I have everything built out with that. I have it completely dialed in and built out for this business to where I can input numbers and it spits out certain KPIs for me. Sure. And then the other main platform that I use is monday.com. Okay. And for those of you guys who aren't familiar with monday.com, 
it's a very inexpensive platform where you can build out your own CRM from scratch. Mm -hmm. So I have built out that complete CRM to be able to track maintenance on vehicles, depreciation on vehicles, um, whether a vehicle is making money or losing money with all factors involved, mm -hmm. and I've built all of that out. I would strongly encourage people not to pawn off their numbers to somebody else. Yeah because then you get lost in translation for what's really moving my business. Mm. So even now with 200 cars in this fleet, I do the books. Mm. What would be the type of car, or like the, the um, maybe category of car that you would recommend yeah. for a starter? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. It is the most frequent question that I get. You know, Brandon, what kind of car do I buy? And if I had to give you a short form answer that applies to the most amount of people, I would say stick to the economy cars. Mm. Economy cars on Turo and our market here are gonna be at an 80% utilization. I call them rabbits. They're just gonna be out every day making money. They're cheaper to maintain. Mm -hmm. It's easier to get parts. They're less likely to go down to recalls because the manufacturer puts a lot of money in development mm -hmm. of it because they know they're building a lot of them and they don't want them to go out and go down and have mm. to pay for warranty work. I would say stick to economy cars that are easy to find, that you know you can service. With the case of Fiat's that we've got, we've got 60 of them because if they were to turn around right now and look at parts, like I could probably build a Fiat from scratch <laughs> with the parts that we've got. Yeah. You know, so that just makes it efficient for, for sure. me to boom, one's down, let's fix it. Or one's down, let's move them to another one. Mm -hmm. So you got it, like the key is to find the cars in your market that work and then make sure that you have a bunch of them. Thank you so much for watching the video with Brandon. He's an amazing guy and we'll put all the links in the description down below to check out Brandon, check out his website, check out his coaching program. And then also, if you wouldn't mind, consider subscribing to our channel. We have a ton of amazing content and other amazing business tours that we've done as well. Again, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.